This is the Forgotten Ways Podcast, the show where we explore what it looks like to both love God and honor the earth. Join me, Brandon Scott Elrod, in fun interviews with friends who are clergy, philosophers, politicians, business owners, and regular folks like you and me, who are all learning and growing in both our faith and our environmental stewardship. Hey everybody, this is Brandon Elrod. I'm here with Doug Brown, a longtime friend of mine. Doug is a former pastor who went on to uh, create a nonprofit for people struggling with infertility. Doug holds a master's degree in philosophy from Talbot Seminary, and he is a very good conversationalist. Welcome, Doug, back to the program. Thank you so much. I'm excited to be here. Um, this is one of my favorite places to be and talk. It's so fun. <laughs> <laughs> this is a good time. So to, today we're talking about um, environmentalism in politics and where Christians seem to default in the process and looking at how that has changed over time and um, and why that is. So in a nutshell, Doug, where... Do you see the environmental church? Nah. <laughs> That's the wrong way to say it. The, the evangelical church, um, when it comes to public perception and where it falls in the in the political spectrum. Yeah, I go, well, you chose a really small topic today, Brandon. Just, just real quick, let's jump right just, into just, it. Just solve this one real quick. Um, yeah, it's it's well, a big topic and a lot that could be said, but. Um, I think that whatever way you slice the issue, I think that when you, when you said those words, where does the evangelical church fall within this scheme of a, a, it seems like a growing gap in the way of our political parties, it see, I have an opinion about it. Like I don't fall thinking well, fairly neutral. So I think I think just even at that, there's a sense of this being like a charged conversation, okay. which I just want to even address at the beginning. That hopefully we don't you know make people upset. Oh, maybe it might make some people upset, but um, just it, it's charged. It feels yeah, right. charged, and I, I think I think there is a good place to even start. That why do we? Why is that our feeling? Right, of feeling just like. Oh, I'm upset. <laughs> you know, right. like you're going to give an answer to this question, and I'm upset. Um, well, and, I, and I think that's an interesting dynamic. It just that that layers that, that kind of bathes the whole conversation. So then, maybe to go along with that, we should lay out what we're hoping to take away. Yeah, I think that's a great idea. Um, I would hope to. To walk away with uh, with freedom and, and permission to have people vote their conscience, mm. vote their spiritual, their true, well thought out spiritual conscience, mm-hmm. rather than just selecting a party line. Yeah, because they have to because they've signed up for it. They're on the clipboard now, mm-hmm. <laughs> so they have to agree with everything, whichever side they belong to. Yeah. Um, that's what I would hope. I would hope that people in the church felt yeah. some freedom to move with their convictions and that that's, that's okay. And that's exactly how the system's designed to operate yes, when it's yeah. operating well. Yeah, exactly. Yeah, I think in, in addition to that, just to add to those thoughts, I would say I, I think that there's a growing sense that there, there needs to be more nuance in the way that we've split up party thinking. Mm. I think that's true across the board. Um, I think there will always be people who just are view the other side as crazy and, you know, yeah. so far gone. But I think there's a, there's a growing middle. I hope that mm-hmm. that would say that there's nuance in these conversations. Um, I think in our conversation, when it comes to the environment, I think I would want people to, to see that, uh, just because you're part of, a, of of one party doesn't mean that you have you're now fall in line with all things right that that have to do with the way that party views the environment that that their nuance can be brought in and you can have you know one view that's maybe feels liberal and when it comes to the environment and, and one view that feels conservative when it comes to you know fiscal reform or 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 the opposite you know right. a conservative view on the environment that Whatever it may be, I just I would want people to have the freedom to to have a conversation about the environment 
in the arena of politics and, and not feel a general sense of fear, which, which, right. which um, like we said, kind of, there's a lot of charged feelings going into it. Yeah. I think there's, is, I, I think even more so this last, um, this last cycle with um, President Trump, I think there have been a lot of folks who have felt very defensive when there's been um, backlash or, yeah. you know, criticism against policies that he's enacting mm-hmm. or, um, you know, rescinding or, or whatever. And I think people, uh, there are some people who just feel, feel hurt mm-hmm. and like it's a personal attack. And so they come out swinging yeah. um, to defend a position that maybe they really at their core don't even hold that strongly to. but. Right. It feels personal, so they're going to make it personally. Right. right. So, it, obviously, this is this is a really complex and <laughs> yeah. But um, so, I guess the the question being has has this split always been this dramatic? You know, two main parties in looking at at voting records. It seems that decades back, even just in the seventies and the sixties, that mm-hmm. that government voted much more closely together. There was a lot of overlap. Yeah. And even looking at the first Earth Day, uh, it was a collaboration. It was a collaborative effort between a Republican and a Democrat. It was a Democrat yeah. who who authored the bill, who, who got it championed, huh. and he invited in a Republican to join and bring this thing to life. Yeah. And it was a bipartisan effort, and it resonated with people. Yeah. It was um, timely, but it invited both sides in, and it almost seems like there's no way that could happen today. <laughs> yeah, it does feel like that, doesn't it? Um, I think there there does seem to be a, a widening gap. Um, I'm not a politician. I'm more of a, a philosopher, or I don't know what you would <laughs> call me. Um, so I think the part that I, I see that I see um, there being that separation goes back to uh, goes back to the way we handled evolution and a, a growing sense in in the liberal community and whatever that would be at that time to say we need to have more room to have other ways to explain natural processes other than just punting to God all the time. So you have this introduction of an evolutionary system that I think terrifies conservative Christians. Hmm. And there's a little bit of that like baby is thrown out with the bathwater and that any type of care for the earth is now this is now the in the hands of this liberal thinking Mm -hmm. that, you know, okay, what's next that you're going to say that we all evolved or something like that. And and it all gets lumped together. Um, and, and you rarely have those connections where like that first earth day or, and I think there, that, that when it comes to the environment, that split is born essentially. I, I would say in that, in that, that time period where anything that has to do with environmentalism is seemed as a, a real departure from family-based conservative Christian thinking, mm-hmm. which is just, that should never have happened, you know? I mean, right. <clears throat> even going back to then, there wasn't enough room for nuance. You know, there wasn't enough room to agree with a part of something <clears throat> and not the entirety of it. So I think yet, if something is there that I think we need to go back and investigate. Well, especially since <clears throat> the idea of, of environment, the idea of home, Mm. is really universal. I mean, it affects everybody. Yeah, everybody yeah. lives and exists <laughs> in a place. Yeah. And do we care about the place we live? Do we want it to be healthy? Do we want it to give us food that is healthy? Do we want it to uh, sustain? Do we want it to have enough water? All these, all these questions seem like no-brainer yeah. questions that have nothing to do with politics. Yeah, and those topics, they're not divorced from... Um, just like a way of viewing the world, like they're they're universal. You can't you can't right. divorce those topics and say that's just the way that you know these people think who are progressive and they want it. No, I mean like that's an that's a forever ingrained in us. 
we walk on the earth. Yeah. Really, when we walk out of our house in the morning, we step on the earth. And, and it's part of who we are. It's not, that's not part of a, any political party or any movement. In right. environment. The, the idea that you exist in an environment is a universal human principle, not a party principle. Right. And in, in the way we treat our environment ought to be universally discussed at every level, not just in the, in these realms of, well, I'm for the environment. Well, I don't care about it. Yeah, therefore, like, yeah. <laughs> my counterpoint has to be, right. I have no choice but to hate the environment. <laughs> right. That's No one is that. No one is, right. is falls into one of those camps. It makes me think, um, I'm sorry if this is a, a left turn or whatever, but it makes me think of when uh, the United States has, and then you could correct me if I'm wrong on this, has backed out of the Paris Accords, which mm-hmm. is a set of um, uh, agree, agreements that we've made uh, kind of across the globe to, to, to make some steps towards environmentalistic right. goals. Um, I feel like there's this outrage that we did that. When pre, I mean, I don't know how many people knew what were even in them or the steps right. that we were taking to make them. It's just that it's this like a political fire that, well, we went away from what the rest of them are doing and we want to go for. But at the core of it is probably would be a, a healthier conversation would be what about the environment literally that you are in right now? Right. Like the, the, the space that you exist in start there. Mm-hmm. Um, and and that will then go into conservative, liberal, Democrat. It doesn't matter. We each have an environment that we ought to take. Would you say like ownership over? I guess of absolutely. And and I don't think anybody out there would would consciously say, yeah, I I want to be less healthy. Yeah, <laughs> I I would like to drink water that's a little bit more polluted. <laughs> right. Uh, it's 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 a it's there's benchmarks. We we want clean water. We want healthy food. We want less chemicals. We want the same things. So politically, then, do you feel like the conservative position is a retort or a backlash simply against an opponent? And so we've hmm. we've defaulted to this um, staunch, dismissive yeah. position on yeah. environmental matters um, because it's coming from the other side. Yeah, I totally think so. I think that's the that's probably the I don't know the the thing that would mark the political landscape if there is a political landscape like that we have now. The thing that makes it so. What it is, is that it's separated. It's the, it is the idea that we are going in opposite directions. You know, one side looks at the other and says, you just reject that there's any environmental issues at all. The other side says, like, you just think the sky is falling. Mm-hmm. Um, and I think the problem is, is that the way we've set our systems up is that they, they need to be in opposition to each other to allow people to fall on one side of the coin. And I think we, yeah. that, that we've done a disservice to people at that point. Oh, a terrible disservice. To say, well, this is the party that doesn't care about the environment. This is the party that does. Nobody, nobody, That that's like a, a mannequin world where we, we've made it that you have to be on one of these. Things. It, no one is actually like that. Right. You know, no one actually views the world like that. I think we ought to have parties that represent the way we live our lives more. And I think we live our lives more moderately. You know, mm-hmm. yeah, like I said, nobody wants to drink clean, dirty water. Um, but nobody wants to be hyperactive, you know, living, you know, in a sterile environment, you know, that's comp- zero weight. That's very difficult too as well. So I think sure. we, we just, by our, in and of ourselves, we are more moderate thinking. So why don't our parties reflect that? Well, and even people who may be on an extreme end of the spectrum of super involved with environmental stewardship and protection and, and activism and all this yeah. doesn't automatically mean that they don't want to be fiscally responsible Right and wise and stewarding resource yeah. financial resources totally. and you know depend on the government for everything. Yeah, the, these those are the boxes that we are being put in. Yeah, um, regardless of what party we're in. Yeah, and it it complicates matters like environmental stewardship, biblical environmental stewardship. Right, um, because I think. Christians feel that they have to pick a side and then it just accept everything that goes with it. Yeah. And therefore we have to dismiss 
notions of climate change. We have to dismiss, <laughs> right, yeah. um, you know, negative impacts of chemicals and things like that right. and just uh, kind of turn a blind eye or yeah. put, her, put her head in sand yeah. um, because that's what party affiliation right. is being represented as, perhaps by the media, perhaps by the other side. Yeah. Perhaps that's exactly how our party is behaving. Yeah. Um, I think at the core of it is, and, you know, maybe the people who are in politics don't want to think about it like this, but in my, from, from where I sit, uh, I think that at the core of humanity, we are not political, that the, that life isn't split up into po- political decisions. Politics has plays a really healthy role in our society, but it, it talks about things that go deeper than politics. And to me, those are, um, issues of life, issues of environment, issues of responsibility, of, of purpose. Um, and and those, those topics aren't just wholly political. The idea of, of personhood, the idea of environmentalism, the, the idea of, of caring for those less fortunate, you like a responsibility to the poor, a responsibility to those suffering of, of immigrants. Th- those are biblical, yeah, philosophical, ethical issues that we spend too much time thinking about them politically and not enough time thinking about them um, from their philosophical, ethical, and in a lot of cases, biblical perspective. And I think that that's where we get a lot of the problem is yeah. politics wants to pull us and, and, you know, polarize us. Yet if we were to maybe dive into some of the ethical things without thinking about politics first, we would come up with more nuanced ways of thinking. Would you say that that then is a, is a greater responsibility that we are going to be held to? I think so. I think you can say Jesus is very controversial um, and politically controversial in a mm-hmm. lot of ways, um, but constantly drove people back to the, a responsibility to the creator, a responsibility to the father. You know, you owe your love and care to the, to the father, to, to God, which then dictated the way you viewed so many things, which from, from a first century point of view, it really kind of fell all over the map. I mean, he was pro taxes, but pro, you know, you know, philanthropy and helping the poor, pro women. Uh, It's just like all over the map. You know what I mean? And it really, he was guided by a sense of, um, priority given from from God, from the Father. And I think mm-hmm. we, we have to be the same way. And if we are the same way, most likely then we're going to fall all over the political spectrum. And, and I would say our, our guiding light would, would, would come from the creator. So that's going to take us all over the place. Mm-hmm. Um, but w- it's hard to do that. And, and we yeah. get, I think we get fearful to fall all over the place on the political spectrum because it's just not the norm. It's not the norm at all. Well, let's talk about the fear. What is what's that fear path for for the average person? Um, fear of what it says about them. Fear of what is going to happen to them. Mm. Fear of rejection. Fear of being lumped in with someone that they don't wish to be. Where, where do you think the main fear points are? Yeah. It's a great question. I, I think that the you know what came to my mind is um, it, this is probably the r- I don't know if this is the right way to talk about it. Forgive me if I make a mistake, but um, almost like a gang mentality. Is that uh, too far to say? I don't know where you going. Um, <laughs> I, I think there's this sense of like I'm gonna join this gang, and I you know there's mm. like I'm now this. You know I'm a I don't know enough about gang. I don't want to say anything wrong, but or say anything that's untrue, but I would say there seems to be this idea that I have now jumped into this gang, like, and now I'm in, I can't even think about getting out and everything that this opposing gang, like this turf war, so to speak, Mm. is just that a turf war Mm. and we are fighting for battleground. Mm -hmm. Um, and I think a lot of the, the environment, the modern, media environment that we are bathed in kind of puts us and says, yeah, that is the way to do it. It's this like gang war between yeah. two different opposing opinions. And I think that's where the fear comes in. It's 
it's scary to even a, a commit to one. And once you've committed to one, now it's even it's even more scary to say that. Oh yeah, you know I, I kind of agree with our our rival gang. <laughs> and it's like what? How can you mean you're going to get you know yeah. jumped or something like that? Yeah. I think it's it is similar in a lot of ways. So I I hear identity. Yeah. I hear safety. Mm. Safety in numbers. You know, safety in the the numbers you're familiar with. <laughs> right. Yeah. Um, and yeah, what kind of consequence would there be if you started to question groupthink? Right. Yeah. Yeah, those those can be scary things. And then I think when you tie in the, the fact that we're talking about our climates and our environments that we live in, um, those those things really, those play a huge part, you know. I, I To the point, I mean, you, know, you just need to look into the modern way of the things that have been happening, the way we talk about the environment. There are... It's a, it's a militant response, uh, seemingly on both sides. On both yeah. sides is this militant, yeah. you're trying to, you're, your eyes are closed, you're going to lead us into a scorched, boiled earth, you know, from one opponent. But then from the other side, it's, you are just, you've missed it, you're, you know, you're crazy, there's a mean things being said. On both sides, it's, it just seems yeah. so, it seems like the way that we've decided to deal with this is this gang war kind of mentality, which, I mean, can't be productive at the end of the day. I mean, yeah. someone, it's like we're, we're expecting someone to be screamed out of the room, which we just have to look at our history, that that doesn't, that doesn't seem to work. Right. I think another fear that people have, and and we've certainly heard this before, but that it's a slippery slope. Yeah, it's a slippery slope. When you concede one point, then it's just a matter of time before you concede the next next point. And it's almost viewing it as compromise, mm-hmm. like oh, you've just compromised your values. One. And then it's going to happen again, and and pretty soon, um, you've you've lost the entire footing that you that you stand on. Right. Um, which, you know that that's there's an alarmist, uh, obviously huge fear based um, concern in that. Yeah. Um, how often do you encounter that kind of messaging or that kind of attitude uh, within the church? Yeah, I think that that is the sentiment is that idea that incremental changes leads down this path of total abandonment abandonment yeah of any kind of right thinking whatever you would whatever you would call right right mm-hmm. thinking um, and I think that that's that idea is constantly brought up well you gave on this yeah and you gave on this but I think in the, the 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 heart of what that person is saying, there might be an un, there might be an untruth in the way they're viewing it. Mm-hmm. A slippery slope would be to say you truly yeah you truly have um, slipped on this one idea that says well okay I believe that this now is true, which then has a, ch- a kind of a chain reaction of events that says well now you have to concede all these other things. Well, and it's and it's more more distinctly saying this thing that I used to believe was evil, I now call good right, or wrong. I now call right when that's not really what we're talking about. Exactly. Yeah. And I think that's, you know, in a way, sometimes a misunderstanding of what it like that slippery slope fallacy where it's like, Oh, you conceded that you, you, you've changed your mind on one topic. Well, you might as well just write them all off and this person's gone. You know, that's not the way a slippery, Right. That, humans aren't slippery slopes. You right. know, we we are an aggregate of millions of opinions about a variety of different things that changes with new information, yeah. and new perspectives. Um, to say that a human being can't change their mind about something based on a new perspective, I mean, is giving someone very little room. To be a growing person <laughs> right. at all. Right. You know? To mature as a human. <laughs> so, I mean, if you locked me in at any one stage of my life and, and said if I gave in any direction I'm on a slippery slope, I'm going either – I'm going to hell no matter what at some point. How would you even come to faith <laughs> right. without the ability to change your perspective on – Totally. What you held previously. Exactly. So I think that it might just be a misidentification. It, th- what you said is that's the sentiment, but I think the sentiment might be a little bit skewed. And that when someone, 
well, we'll just take someone who's going from viewing that there are no environmental concerns to someone who is. That, that simply could just be someone who has new information, who has learned mm-hmm. th- that their experience lines up with a, a certain statistical thing and they want to change the way that they interact with their environment. That's yeah. not a slippery slope. That's that's an that's a growing person, right? Um, and, and and to say that that now that person is on this slippery slope and and, and so much so to be lost, I think is is a misunderstanding of the way people grow. Yeah, and I think uh, to your point, it, it really is just a matter of of being circumspect. It's mm. it's not even questioning core beliefs. It's, it's not questioning core beliefs. Yeah, it's it's just looking, opening your eyes, where you live. Right. If you go ride your bike on the riverbed, right. Does it look great? Does it look beautiful and clean? Or is there garbage everywhere? Mm-hmm. Well, if there's garbage everywhere, maybe you start to get concerned about that. Right. You, you start to get concerned about where that garbage is going to go. Right, yeah. Because, hey, maybe it is going to drop right into the riverbed and then go washed out in the next rain. Yeah. In which case, this is right in my backyard, mm-hmm. and this concerns me. Yeah. It may be a massive leap for that person to try and connect that with climate change. Yeah. And they don't have to. But they can go from being unaware and disinterested to now very quickly engaged Hmm. and interested because, oh, there's this thing happening right here in my neighborhood um, that that troubles me. And I would like to see something different. So, I mean, really, we're we're not talking about a, a switch from believing something evil is now good or something wrong is now right, Hmm. but just being open eyed as you go throughout your day and engage with the the world you live in. Exactly. And that's it goes back to what we were saying that um, these conversations aren't strictly political. They're tied into these very core levels of the way we view the world, the way we view our environment, you know. Just because, yeah, you want to, you know, I'm going to organize a, a, a day where a, friend, a couple of friends and I, we ride our bikes down the river trail, we pick up every piece of trash. Yeah. And we, and we try to create a cleaner environment here. That's, you know, that's not just a strictly political thing. It's yeah, just what, a, what it's political just a, party should they choose then? <laughs> no, it's, yeah, exactly. <laughs> but we, we almost feel challenged that like, well, now, now am I a this? No, right. no. You're, 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 you're human. You're, <laughs> you're a citizen. Human. You're someone who was concerned with an issue yeah. uh, and, and you took a stand with it. Same thing from, from the other side. Maybe you, you view all, a lot of people, you know, so how are they not taking a concern? How are they, how do they not care enough? Um, but to not write someone off like that and to, and to say, well, maybe we should have a conversation about it and not make this a big political thing on every, whatever way you side, whatever way you fall, on the issue, you're infected, but you're affected by your environment, and and making a decision of by what you see, like you said, going out your front door, that's that doesn't that's not a slippery slope. That's not now you have to choose a political party. That's just being a human, you know, yeah. being affected by what's around you. Absolutely, absolutely, and and something we talk about with with our kids often is this idea of of being a good citizen. Mm, you know, a good yeah. citizen participates. Yeah. You can be a, a, a citizen of a household. You can be a citizen of a neighborhood. You can certainly be a citizen of the city you live and, and so on. Yeah. What, what does it look like to be a good citizen, to participate well, right. to be active and involved, to be uh, responsible? Right. And um, so I, I think just that lingering question is, is one that can drive this, this particular topic of how do I be environmentally responsible as a Christian, and have it be a non-political thing. Yeah. I'm just doing it because I believe that God cares and because I care yeah. about where I live. Absolutely. And I think if we begin to take up that way of thinking, um, the, the, the polarization between parties begins to fade because we view people with different opinions about environments as citizens who are taking up what they view to be their responsibility. So someone who's, you know, more extreme advocating on a bigger level 
for something like climate change, when we start to view them as a citizen who's speaking out about what they are, you know, they're, they're concerned about, we start to see them as someone who's doing something good. Mm -hmm. Uh, and, And then a lot of dialogue starts to happen. Well, why do you view it this way? Well, why do you view it this way? And Mm -hmm. it's not a polarizing thing. Our care for the environment is something that unites us, which ought to be true of politics. Politics is about citizens. Citizens ought to talk about what concerns them and come to mutual understandings instead of chopping them in half and flipping them on, on either side. Um, I, I think Something like the environment is something that could unite us, absolutely. And it, as well, it should. I mean, yeah. it, as you said earlier, it is a, a human issue. Absolutely. If you're a human being, then you're affected either in a microcosm on the pad of ground where you live or big picture, wherever your focus is. And yeah. maybe there's some freedom and permission also for folks to default to how their brain is wired. Yeah. And if you are a big picture thinker, then yeah, get in, get involved in a big way, yeah. big picture level. If you are a really fine tuned detail oriented person, yeah, then maybe it's not about the big picture. Maybe it is very much about boots on the ground right here, right now, this, this plot of land at the corner, <laughs> right? It's my, my backyard, yeah. like literally my backyard. Yeah. And what a, what a great blend. We need everybody. Yeah. We need everybody, and this, this, yeah, this should bring everybody together. Um, so, as far as Christians and our uh, representation out there, mm-hmm. do you think it's it's too late to outgrow the any caricature that may exist um, politically or otherwise as it pertains to caring about the environment? Yeah, I think the time is ripe for a fresh perspective. I think Christians and and believers have this amazing connection with creation in that we believe that we serve the God who created. Crazy, It's crazy. I mean, we have this, we we could show a care for our creator in, in a care for our creation in such a huge way that that the, the caricature of us being, you know, uh, unconcerned with it or, or not wanting to take up that mantle could really be changed um, if we just even in our own backyards saw what was what the environment we were placed in was something that was ordained mm-hmm. and that we have a dominion over. The, the the spaces that we're in and a call to cultivate them and to bring vitality and goodness to them, I mean, that would change the world. I mean, yeah. it really would. And I think Christians then, it wouldn't just be, you know, well, because we really like the earth. You know, no, we there's a deeper connection that this was given to us and we're stewards of it. I mean, that that is such a rich, ancient idea that needs to be refound. Well, and from that perspective, I mean, you can think you could easily make the case that we, more than anyone else, should care. Yeah, absolutely. I mean, yeah. technically, we should care the most. Yeah. If we believe that this place was designed supernaturally by a supernatural God for a supernatural connection with us, right? what's the natural <laughs> outcome of that? <laughs> yeah. Let's take really good care of it. Absolutely. Yep. It reminds me of uh, a movement earlier on in uh, in the 1800s um, by the Quakers, where yeah. the Quakers really became um, the the leading abolitionists. And they took the charge. Mm-hmm. A lot of them died. Mm-hmm. I mean, this was something that they felt through and through was their call from God um, to end the plague of slavery, to care for, to funnel, you mm-hmm. know, Underground Railroad. Yeah. Um, and incredible... Involvement and participation, and I mean, you could use the word activism if you want, but yeah. they were doing the work right. of abolitionism, and and what a what an incredible legacy that is. And um, these are two different things, uh, but I think that there's the same opportunity before us um, as Christians to step outside of. The, the gang mentality you mentioned. Yeah, Step yeah. outside of groupthink, 
yeah. party line um, assumptions and expectations and really return back to the scriptures yeah. if we believe them the way that we say that we do, if we found our uh, our guiding principles and our theology in them the way that we say that we do, then why don't we take the theme of Scripture, of God's interaction with humankind in this place that He designed, the place that still testifies and speaks of God's existence, Yeah. and why don't we... Uh, be good caretakers of it, be good representatives, be good ambassadors. And um, I I do think that this is something we can turn around. Absolutely. I think that the time has never been more right for it. I think all that's missing is a little bit of what we've been doing now is just encouragement to return to some of these older ways of thinking like the the a perspective shift which i think if we uh if we can unite under this desire to pick back up what was put down i think the time is now one last question doug what do you think the net effect is or has been um regarding our witness our influence in the world as we are being pigeonholed politically <laughs> yeah. um, with subjects like this, uh, our you know, party involvement uh, one way or another. Right. I think it's damaging, right? Like our witness has been majorly damaged in, in that, you know, it's like we, we're tone deaf. I think that's the, the, the evangelical movement. It comes across tone deaf when, the, when, when we care about one thing and not a lot of other things, you know, it's like, wow, you guys really, I've just drilled down on this one thing when, you know, many evangelicals know that they wouldn't characterize themselves like that, but they are being characterized like that. Right. So I think that, that you have to, if we're going to talk about witness and the way that people are perceiving evangelicals, I think we need to, we need to, Find areas where we can take a step into um, speaking more fully into things that we do know are true. We do have a belief, like care for what has been given to us, the creation. I think if we were to take a greater step into that, um, it would be it would be great, a great movement in our witness to say. And it would be more accurate, right? It would be more. It wouldn't just be like a better marketing strategy. It would be more accurate to what we're called to be. Absolutely, as members of society, members of of this creation of of we are the walkers of this earth. Yeah. We steward it. We live here. We explore it. We love it. Um, it would be a greater sense of us coming into who we are, the nature in which we've been created, and I think. Just by doing that, people would see us more. Uh, people would see evangelicals more, more, more members of the human race. And I think that I think right. that's what they get. That's that pegging that that they get is, you guys are just out of here. Like you only care about this future heaven, and this doesn't mean anything to you. Which, in, in biblically speaking, couldn't be more further from the truth. So we right. we need to re, re- recapture that we are members. Uh, of this created space. Yeah. Yep. Agreed. All right. Well, we could go on for days. Uh, we could. Uh, yes. <laughs> so we're going to call it here. Uh, Doug Brown, thank you for joining us today. Uh, always enjoy having you on and, and hearing your thoughts and discussing these these small <laughs> <laughs> yes. concepts together. Thank you so much for having me. It was a blast. You've been listening to the Forgotten Ways podcast with Brandon Scott Elrod. To find out more, visit ForgottenWays.org. Join us next time as we once again explore what it can look like to love God and respect the earth, beginning with our own heads, hearts, and homes.